Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's actually kind of a, a good point because it is one of our theses about how we use AI. Um, for to, So when you think about the content that we're creating, right, um, you can sort of think about it in, in the context of uh, there's going to be characters, enemies, NPCs, and then the world and the objects that the world contains. And the thing that people will care most about, the thing that will create uh, emotional connections will be the characters. Um, if emotional connections are established between players and the game, the characters are the vessel for that emotional connection. And so when we think about how we use humans to create the game and AI to create the game, um, we want the humans who have, you know, decades of experience building, uh, building this content that creates these emotional connections and feelings to be working on the most important things that create those connections. So, you know, the priority there is on the characters, the enemies, the NPCs, and then the world. And then AI working um, in the opposite direction, focused on the world and the objects. And then, you know, anything that we can do back up to the character, if there are little details, things that we can, um, you know, what, maybe help drive some of the costs down, that would be good. But our big focus is on using AI to craft the world. Welcome back to another episode of Meta Rick. This is episode number 10. Oh my God, it's starting to feel real. This is great. So every episode we talk to creatives, technologists about artificial intelligence, the metaverse, blockchain technologies, how these are being used by businesses to better engage with our consumers, our employees, and even our investors. Uh, today, we've got an amazing guest, uh, Travis Boudreaux. Um, I am going to take a little bit of a second on this intro because the guy has some of the most badass experience I think I've seen in a minute. Um, Travis, before joining Azure Games as their CTO and co-founder, was a senior software engineer at Upwork, a VP of engineering at Waiter, which if you're unfamiliar is similar to DoorDash, which was uh, very popular in the Southeast as a food delivery platform. He has expertise in full stack engineering. He's led the design of numerous successful enterprise projects, but he is also an angel investor and has supported over 25 startups in the last three years with a focus on rapidly growing marketplaces, FinTech applications, next generation health and wellness products, and startups building great user experiences for the cryptocurrency industry. Uh, now at Azra Games, Azra, um, while other studios are dabbling in AI, Azra Games is the first to build a codex, an in-house AI interface that enables them to quickly test out ideas and build custom tools on top of generative AI models, including a combat kit, character sheets, and 2D, 3D object generators. Codex has already reduced costs by over 50%, and all of that we'll dive into a little bit later. Uh, but the other thing I'll comment on them is Azra Games has one of the most incredible teams in the Web3 gaming space with Sonny Mayugba as the chief brand officer and also uh, bringing in Marco Taro, who's just an industry veteran in the gaming industry um, with EA and killing it with a bunch of successful games. Um, like I believe the big one was, uh, what was it? It was the Star Wars Galaxy it was Star Wars Heroes. Galaxy of Heroes. Yeah. Yeah. So long intro, but warranted because y'all are doing incredible work. So Travis, thanks so much for being here. Let's yeah. um, start by telling people like, where are you at in the world? And let's dive in a little bit to your background. What, what kicked off the story of Travis? Yeah, amazing. Thank you. So our studio is located in Sacramento. I spend most of my time here. Um, and what, what started my story, um, I love playing video games as a kid. Um, I, my parents, you know, uh, bought me an Atari really early on. I was like four or five years old. Uh, Nintendo kind of went all the way up the progression curve of consoles um, and then fell in love with computers and studied computer science. Uh, got into programming because I love games so much I wanted to build them and then never actually did that. Um, got really focused on the e-commerce side of businesses and then ultimately marketplaces was, you know, um, 
as you've uh, kind of outlined already, was a software engineer and techno technology executive for about 20 years. And, um, you know, uh, I think 2013 is when I bought my first Bitcoin. Uh, early 2017 was when I bought uh, my first ETH and always loved the space. Um, always wanted to build in the space. Never wanted to build infrastructure. That was not the thing that interested me. I love building great consumer experiences. Back in 2016, 2017, you know, that just didn't feel possible. Um, but as I started seeing applications come out in 2020, 2021, um, you know, you started to see um, that it actually felt like the industry was at an inflection point, that you could create great consumer experiences. Um, and so, um, you know, just kind of uh, looked at the landscape and saw that there was like this, this intersection of two deep passions of gaming and crypto um, that felt like uh, an amazing opportunity to create those uh, new consumer experiences. I love that. And, and what's incredible is there's so many people in the industry that are focused on one of these topics, right? Like there's folks that are just mm -hmm. dabbling in AI, large language models, folks that are just focused on DeFi and tokenization with cryptocurrency. And then you have folks that are focused on XR, um, kind of the experience layer of the, of the metaverse with, the, with 3D mm -hmm. uh, models and kind of making the internet more three-dimensional, more spatial. You get to dabble with all three of those. <laughs> um, which is kind of incredible. Um, what, what kind of pulled you into, to, was Azra your first experience kind of jumping all in on this? Or was there a project maybe before that that you started with? Uh, I did have a couple of uh, side projects for Web3 that I was playing around with, nothing that I had ever launched. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, um, so Sonny and Mark had known each other for about 15 years. Sonny and I had known each other for about 10 years. Um, and Sonny and Mark had had a conversation and Sonny already knew, um, you know, my interest in, in Web3 and the knowledge that I had already built, both as being a consumer and a participant. Um, and then through building uh, some of the side projects I was working on. Um, and, you know, uh, I, we, I, we tell this story often in the studio and like to new hires and stuff. But uh, I got on the phone uh, one weekend talking to Mark. And uh, I walked uh, my driveway for like three hours talking to Mark and um, just hit it off. And I knew that, um, you know, wanting to wanting to build games as a as a uh, player, as a child, um, there was like no one better to learn from uh, than Mark. And so um, I was just uh, sort of like head over heels uh, with the mission from the jump. And, you know, it was all in and let's go. And I think, so with, with your technical background, I know a lot of folks, when they think um, gaming and like a gaming developer, they immediately jump to like Unity and Unreal Development or building 3D objects in Blender. Um, is that where you spend a lot of your time or is is there there kind of a different focus you have as far as the infrastructure or your, your kind of area? Of yeah, I, I spend more of my time on infrastructure, technology, strategy, um, once uh, once we kind of saw what was possible with AI, with uh, blending large language models with different open source libraries, um, I began spending a lot of time there. We have a, you know, I think you mentioned earlier um, about just how experienced the team is. We have over 250 years of RPG development experience in the studio. Um, we have uh, an engineering team of 12. We have uh, an art team of I think 10 to 15 or so. Um, it would be a poor use of my time if uh, I was trying to, uh, <laughs> if I was trying to create models myself. Uh, those guys are amazing experts, um, professionals, um, you know, with uh, no comparison. Uh, they, they, they crush it in every regard. Um, and so the role that I generally play um, is to uh, guide the team on strategy, what could make a great Web3 experience, how can we use AI to reduce our costs. We have some, some pretty aggressive goals um, to drive costs lower, uh, not only on this title, but other titles in the future that we would like to build. Um, and so that's where I invest most of my time. I have a couple follow-up questions on that, but before I do, um... 
before we get too deep into the tactical stuff, um, I just want to zoom out a little bit for the audience. So I know I touched on a little bit of what Azure Games is. It, it's it's mostly focused as like an RPG style game um, built on yep. chain, right? Maybe you could go into some more detail of what Azra actually is and that, that first game that you guys are planning on, on launching or is it already in, in market? No, uh, it's slated for launch in 2025. So we're working on a title called Project Legends right now. That's an action RPG experience set in a uh, world that's a mix of uh, sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, we have released two internal prototypes that we've shown footage on uh, in the last six months, and the team actually just finished their third internal release this week. Uh, we have not released footage yet of that, but I would uh, anticipate by the time uh, this is published, um, we'll either have just released that or would be releasing it shortly thereafter. That's another green flag uh, f from my perspective, of having been around the space for a little while now, is I think you see a lot of these uh, kind of cr crypto based gaming projects that just rush into launches or, or over promise things really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just try and tease everything out. And there, there's something to be said for like letting people be involved in a story as it's happening. That whole idea of community development is it's yeah. important. But I think that being able to build something sustainable um, and focus on creating something real, that's the stuff that's going to stay around um, in two years, three years, 10 years, right? Like that, that's yeah. where I think the, everyone defaults to thinking about Yuga and what they're doing with other side right now. And I know they're dabbling with heavy metal and this tile based building game and some things like that. But I, I think that you guys stand out as a group of people that are building behind the scenes um, and prepping for something big uh, down the road. When you guys yeah. started, um, I know that you launched an NFT project um, a little while back. Uh, how how is that involved in the vision? Was that meant to kind of get an initial set of community, or those pieces going to be in the game, or what was the purpose mm -hmm. with the the NFT launch? So it was a free mint, and we call them play forever passes. They are not playable in game items, um, and we did that very deliberately. One of the things that we wanted to do is. We were growing uh, a community of followers um, pretty quickly. Um, you know, Mark's reputation precedes himself. He had designed eight RPGs already. I think uh, if you sum up the total of revenue generated by those RPGs, um, it's well north of a 1.5 billion. It's probably pushing close to 2 billion in total revenue on RPGs. And so there was a lot of excitement. The community grew really fast and we wanted to give the, the people who were earliest and most loyal to us, you know, some, some token of, uh, of regard to, um, to kind of hold on and be hopeful. The name of the project was the hopeful. Um, but what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to constrain the game designers. We didn't want to put something on chain, make decisions two, three years out from a worldwide launch that we, you know, had to pay off in game somehow. You know, I think um, Mark's, Mark's spoken pretty publicly about this. I think um, the meta of the space circa 2021 um, was very much uh, find a way to sell a land NFT, right? That was where a lot of the big money raises were. Um, and Mark stuck to his first principles. Um, his core philosophy was that in RPGs, um, people care about the characters. They collect the characters. They make their investments in characters. And every time you ask a player to make a decision and fork where they want to invest their time and resources, um, you put pressure on that player and you ultimately create opportunities to compromise and dilute the game. Uh, and so we didn't want to do that and we didn't want to constrain ourselves or the designers in that way. So we built the hopeful as, uh, as something to give to the earliest members in the community um, and reward them with in-game items in the future that can be spun off of those, uh, those NFTs. I love the consistency in that theme of like not over promising, not, not hinging yourselves on this one decision because so many NFT projects that have tried to come out with games end up having to backtrack and say, like, I know we promised this NFT would do all these things, but actually 
we're going to have to take those promises back because we realize it's going to bankrupt our business or that's technically harder than we thought it would be to achieve yeah. that. And like the fact that you guys are more like, no, we're transparently doing this as a gift, as a way to help build community, give you ownership over the characters and, and the idea of what we're doing. I think that that's a really clever way uh, to engage with your community, still participate yeah. in the culture. I think that's big. Was there anything that you guys learned on that journey? I know launching an NFT project is a little different than some traditional kind of community building or marketing exercises. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what were kind of the steps involved in that? And did anything surprise you kind of uh, as you went through that launch? Hmm. One of the things that surprised me was just how fast it, it sold out. It was pretty quick. We had a, a, a few... Um, a few tiers, a few tranches, but each one of those went really quickly. And I believe the, uh, the general release um, beyond the, the two tiers of whitelist went, you know, in less than a minute. I think it was something like 17 or 27 seconds or something like that. It was, it was really quick. Um, I was like actually at my desk watching everything. I was trying to get something uh, like get uh, mint, um, an extra one in the general availability and I wasn't able to, which was uh, kind of funny. Um, I think uh, as far as things that we've learned, um, one, I think we've learned how to manage expectations of the community. I think we've, we've been pretty consistent in communicating with them, you know, uh, this is a multi-year project, right? Um, there's there's um, a, a huge window of time between now and when we uh, plan to deliver the game. Um, and we're asking you guys to come on this journey with us, provide us feedback, be interested in being early alpha testers when we start opening things up for people outside of the studio to play. Um but, you know, just know that uh, the development process takes time. I think we've um, explored probably four or five different concepts before we landed on the final concept of, of the game that we're on now. Um, and, you know, that was a, a bit of a discovery process and, um, you know, it adds time. And, you know, to your point, some, some studios um, can go dark for extremely long periods of time. Um, I think even when uh, we we do go heads down, um, we have full time people uh, in our community um, who are engaging with people, showing that you know this isn't a rug pull. We haven't run away. We haven't walked away from the community or abandoned anyone. Um, and yeah, I think we've we've learned a lot about managing a community uh, pre launch. And I think ultimately, once the game uh, is live and global launch. Um, we believe those people in the community are going to be our biggest evangelists, our biggest advocates, and we think it'll have a huge impact on uh, our growth strategy. Totally. It's it's interesting you talk about how fast it sold out. I, I remember the day you guys launched the Mint, I was getting DMs from people in like the, the Yuga Labs Discord and the, that own apes and stuff, and they're really? like, hey, this Azure Games project they've raised 10 million from Andreessen and horowitz a16z they seem legit and like everyone was like getting after it that that day mm -hmm. and i was like oh wait i i know who those guys are like yeah those guys are rad you should, you should go buy one <laughs> 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 just totally chucked my pen <laughs> um but yeah there remember, you go keep, keep sending them keep sending them <laughs> yeah I, mean, I remember feeling that excitement and going like oh wow this world the longer i'm in this space the tighter knit and the 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 cooler this community tends to be it's so supportive Supportive. Um, one other yeah. one other question on that kind of launch strategy with the game is um, so so with Web three projects like community is such a big piece of it. This mm -hmm. idea of decentralization, this this idea of community forward uh, building. So so what makes a Web three game different than a Web two game outside of just being on chain? Is there anything that um, in particular is different about the development process or the launch process building in Web three versus in Web two? Yeah, I think it really depends on the studio that's building and, and their approach to things. You know, our first principle goes back to, you know, Mark having built eight of these and having built eight of these before Web3 technologies were even an option. Um, and that first principle is that we're, we're building something that has to be fun, right? 
Like, um, there is no floor price. There is, um, you know, no, there is no asset price where a chart goes up if the game isn't fun. Um, I don't, uh, I don't care how much you, um, you work on your tokenomics. Um, I have a Twitter thread where I talked about like our approach to tokenomics, um, last year. Um, and we have like this very simple phrase that, um, that fun is the forcing function for demand, right? Like the game has to be fun first and foremost to drive a healthy player base, to drive a large group of people who want to play this, regardless of if there's an asset underlying it. Um, and if you can do that, you'll drive demand. And then wherever you incorporate Web3 technologies, um, that demand will uh, be driven in large part by that by that large player base who's dedicated to the game. You know, so our a lot of people will talk about things like, you know, they believe ownership and NFTs will drive uh, engagement and retention. I think we tend to be contrarians. We we tend to think that. Um, fun is the thing that should drive retention and engagement, not just the asset price. Um, so, and, you know, if you look at the number of people in the space, um, Galaxy of Heroes had over 100 million downloads. There are not 100 million people on chain to play this game. So if you try to force only people who have already uh, who already have a MetaMask wallet. Uh, if you try to um, grow a game just from the people who exist on chain, um, you're limiting your audience by, you know, orders of magnitude. And so we fundamentally believe that building with a focus on fun first, simplifying the user experience, using Web3 where it makes sense, and not overcomplicating it and letting people who just want to have fun play for fun and letting the Web3 experience reveal itself over time to those people is the is the right approach. And the games that are ultimately successful and become, you know, forever franchises in this space are going to be the games that take that approach. So, so important. Uh, almost everyone I respect that works in the Web3 world, like like on the creative side, for example, I've talked to a lot of agencies on, on the show that provide services around the space. And so mm -hmm. consistently, they're like, you can't start with Web3 as a solution. You have to first define the problem. And then Web3 yep. is a tool in your toolkit to solve the problem. It's not just Web3, Web3, Web3. It's the blockchain is this list yeah. of IDs that live on chain that are non-fungible and associated with assets. And like, where does that become useful to use that technology for a purpose? Um, so there's belief in the value of that purpose. And there's areas in gaming that I think make sense for that. But if it's not fun, none of that, none of that even matters in the first place. I think there's so much more yeah. than that. And I think too, that even the, even the games that some people would, um, I think there'll be games that are on chain that ultimately um, feel like uh, simulation, financial simulation tools, um, things that are like uh, The Sims, Football Manager, EVE Online, um, those sorts of games. And I think even those games for the people who love them and play them are ultimately um, extremely fun. And some people will, will start to play these as they become Web3 enabled um, with a motivation for profit. Um, but by and large, people play games because they're fun and because it's a great way to be entertained. Um, and absent of that, I, I think you, ha you have something... Um, you have something that may that may pop, that may get people's attention for a moment, but it'll never thrive and it'll never endure. Completely echo that. And and so when you when you talked about um, it has to be fun, I, I love that. It was just like an ethos. It kind of ties back into the beginning of the conversation. You mentioned there were like two really big focal points as, as a as a leader in the company. One is the idea of 
making a great experience like that's that's focal mm-hmm. point number one and then focal point number two you mentioned was like reducing costs with things like ai and innovative processes yep. um so to that that great experience to you what makes a great experience uh for this type of game like are there is there a checklist of things that you focus on um, that are almost like sub items under great experience or that tie into making the game more fun yeah i, I tend to think of it in um in two different spectrums one is that ultimately the game uh, is fun to you, right? So um, for that to be the case, you have to identify to some degree with the story that's being told. There has to be a character or multiple characters that you can identify with that you want to, you know, spend this time, you know, immersing uh immersing in this character's life, walking around in this world, doing the things that the character is able to do. There's some very mechanical things that connect back to gameplay that, you know, matter. Um, The team uh, spends a a huge amount of time focused on building the best controls possible. Um, The the control system, you know, has to feel like a a triple A game uh, for everyone in the team. That's a, that's a pretty high benchmark. Um, but as, uh, the other, uh, the other, you know, um, sort of, uh, experience part that I, I tend to think about a lot is all of the things that, um, create friction, uh, before you ever even get to those points. Right. So, um, what, you know, is, is the, does the download take too long? Once you've downloaded, do you have to, you know, uh, download gigs and gigs of content uh, after every update before you can, uh, you know, get back into the game? Do you have to sit there and wait five or ten minutes for all these downloads, or, or can you get right in? Um, you know, uh, Mark uh, sets this uh, benchmark, this, this huge goal for the team is like, I want players to be able to have their first fun experience within nine seconds. So launch the game within nine seconds, you should be having fun. Um, and so that's a, that's a really big internal objective for the studio. Um, and I think you can, you can filter most questions about user experience through that lens. Is there anything in the game that prevents someone from getting into fun as quickly as possible? Yeah, it's this combination of like compelling story, building great creative, and then reducing friction and, and annoyances and pain points that would distract or take you away um, from from that fun experience. I imagine that yeah. there's a balance here in um, the creative side of the company and the studio, like that's building that story and coming up with the ideas, and especially when you sit in this this Web three kind of category. I feel like you start to have this endless possibilities. It really attracts people that are inspired, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial, and come up with big, big ideas, right? It's part of why it launches 2025. But on the technical side, there's probably some pretty big challenges, which I'm guessing is what's driving thinking around leveraging AI and and more innovative ways to try and cut down on costs. How do you collaborate with creative? Like, what, What makes that relationship work between the studio and the technical kind of side of the business? Yeah, so something that's really great is we have uh, uh, our producer, uh, Neil, um, is a a very creative individual. He's uh, led uh, creative uh, on different projects in EA for over a decade. Um, And it's pretty rare for a producer to be um, as creative as he is. Um, And our uh, VP of creative, uh, Michael Noriega, is uh, also a... uh, technical artist by trade and was was an engineer early on in his career so um, he has a a huge amount of technical experience and so there's this interesting thing that you see throughout our studio is you often see the um, collection of two or more um, skill sets that are often not occupied by the same person, right? So Neil is very creative and extremely organized. Noriega is ex- that is a exactly. power. <laughs> exactly. And um and so uh Noriega is also extremely creative and extremely technical, right? And so I think, you know, really what makes 
the whole thing work is just the people that occupy each seat and just how rare they are and, and how much of um, a cheat code it is for the studio that these key people uh, have multiple superpowers that almost never exist in the same person at the same time. So that that is wild. Um, I think that if everyone had that, then agencies wouldn't exist, right? Or, or like talent agencies <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't exist. The whole reason yeah. talent agencies yeah. and record labels exist is because the best artists in the world are horribly unorganized. They don't care about business. Like they care about creating great art and, and they have this talent yeah. that is so rare and amazing that they need a team of people that can support the organization side and the business side to, to let them not worry about it. So when you have someone that is excels at both of those two things, which I'm finding more and more of those individuals in Web3 specifically, I think the nature of this industry kind of just attracts more people like that. But I wonder if that was intentional. Is that something that you, you do something in your recruitment process to find and, and foster that type of talent? Or was that kind of a surprise that you just happen to have yeah. a team like this? I think... You know, going back to cheat codes, it was a huge cheat code that most of the studio worked on Galaxy of Heroes. Um, I think it's a, I think it's always a great signal when you see a leader like Mark, who you know had sort of gone into semi-retirement, make a couple of phone calls, and you know within days uh, have a, a group of ten or fifteen people that he's worked with in the past who want to, you know, you know, pick up their keyboard and do it all over again with them. Right. Um, some of those guys, um, were looking for their next thing to do. Some of them were extremely happy, uh, in what they were doing. Um, so I think ultimately like that's the, the big cheat code. Right. And at that point, um, the, there's this, uh, extensive, uh, network of people, um, from you know having built all these games together and it's really like calling in the the superheroes of all of those past teams and and trying to uh, evangelize them to to join the mission and so at this point you know we have uh 47 48 people um and i think there's about 25 of them uh that have worked together for at least one project a lot of them have worked together on two or more projects and how many of those people are based in sacramento uh, versus remote uh it's pretty close to 30 somewhere between 30 and 35 i think so it's somewhere between 60 and 70 ish percent of the studio is uh is in sacramento that's a lot for for um yeah. so so this is an interesting kind of controversial topic is this idea of remote and hybrid work, right? Like we all mm -hmm. went remote. A lot of people are more productive uh, remote and like do very yeah. well. Like my housemate's a great example. He's an introverted mm -hmm. guy. He focuses so much better when he has his own space and his own routine and he can mm -hmm. just 10X his workload, right? Yeah. Um, but I know other people, especially a lot of salespeople that are like extroverts that think they're more productive at home. They like the convenience of being at home, but really yeah. they need to be in a pit surrounded by a bunch of other people making calls and talking to customers yeah. and feel that energy and that in-office experience can be valuable. And I think that's often forgotten with how much the convenience of at home has really taken off. I was listening mm -hmm. to an episode of My First Million the other day. It's this podcast that talks about business and startups, building companies, one of yeah. my personal favorites. And Sean Purry was talking about as an investor, he likes to bet on companies that if they're like 20 or less people that are in the same studio together. Because in the early yeah. days of building a company, there's such an advantage to like those extra couple hours of whiteboarding sessions. Like I remember when I was at Snapwire, there was times where it's yeah. like, hey, we've been busy on calls all day long and our only gap of fresh air is right as work's ending. And the fact that we're all in the same room means we can turn around and spend an hour drinking a beer or a glass of wine or something and just whiteboarding out a problem that's been bugging us for three months and then solve it. And those little things compound. They add up over time. I'm not trying to downplay remote work, but I'm curious to get your take as someone who's worked in that environment and as an investor, like... Yeah. Like, do you see a, a benefit to the, that in-house versus remote or how, how do you feel about the, the, the two different yeah. options? 
So I'll, I'll wear two different hats. And also, um, I, I think I first started working remote um, at some point in 2008 or 2009. And I did that for about eight years. And around 2016, 2017, I went back into the office. Um, I think that was the right decision. Um, we ultimately took that company public. Um, worked remotely again for a few years. Uh, and now um, I spend probably about 80 to 90% of my time uh, in studio in Sacramento. Um, and I think, so I agree with, uh, with uh, Sean's thesis there that in the early days, zero to one, um, if you have the right team in the same room, it's, it's a great cheat code because you basically, you can kind of think about it to, to a previous point in this conversation, talking about friction in the user experience. If you think about working together as a user experience and you want to iterate fastly, what's the thing that you need to get rid of? What's the thing that ruins that experience? It's friction in the communication funnel. And so if you put people in the same room and all they have to do is look over to each other and say, hey, come over here. Hey, give me a, give me a second set of eyes on this. What do you think about this? If you can do that instead of send a calendar invite, you know, get a Zoom set up, hope that, you know, one person is um, not running errands because that's like the best time for them to do certain things. You, that will compound day over day, week over week, month over month, and it will get you uh, to product market fit much faster, most likely. That also is not an antidote to having the wrong team. Uh, if you have the wrong team, it doesn't matter what kind of cheat codes you give to them, what kind of multiples, the, the base stat is so low, it has no real material impact. Okay. Now, also, if you have something that is more established or you have the right team who has relationships already developed and works remotely, um, you can be extremely productive uh, in those scenarios. But I tend to think that that mode of work is much more suited for the, the problem you're solving, not being finding product market fit for a brand new thing. Um, because even if you have the right team, uh, the tools still have, even if you have the right team and they're really good at remote and they have really good processes, the tools will still introduce latency and friction. And so, in those two scenarios of you have the right team in both and you have uh, basically both the optimal scenarios, there's still a good chance that the in-person team just beats the uh, remote team. Uh, so that's just me thinking about it from uh, having worked remotely, having worked uh, in office, having led teams. As an investor, it's something I would think about, but it probably wouldn't be one of the key decision making criteria in my heuristic for saying, do I want to take a bet? I would take a bet much, uh, much more likely on established traction if they're not pre C um, or the team. Is this the right team? Are these the right people? I would start looking at that, you know, probably much later. Um, not in the first and second order items that I would be checking off in my diligence process. That is an incredible answer. Um, and it's awesome to hear how comprehensive your experience is. I think I hear that in the answer. The fact that you've worked in those environments at different sized organizations. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't have said this three years ago, but I couldn't agree more. Um, I think a couple of years ago, I was so gung ho on like, I can be productive remote. So everyone can be productive remote and remote's just so much better for my lifestyle. Yeah. So everyone should do it. Yeah. And why wouldn't you do it? Right. But now that I've had more time to like process it and do some more research on it and hear people like you mm -hmm. explain their perspectives on it, 
that idea of that early stage market fit, there's just such a benefit to having access to the same room. Even if you're not in the studio every day, like at Snapwire, we were, we mm-hmm. were hybrid. So a lot of the times I would spend most of my day making cold calls or, or um, taking meetings at home um, and, and do yeah. most of my client work at home, building proposals and stuff like that. But then I'd come into the office a few hours a week or for collaborative sessions and like be able to do deep dives. And I think that balance between the two um, can be can be really effective as well. Super interesting. So, so thinking about the back back to the technical side of Azure. So we were kind of talking about the cultural piece for a second. But with, with the, the technical aspect, so you've got these big creative visions. You've got this this incredible team of people that understand the technology so I'm guessing that makes it a little bit easier to collaborate with the with creatives and kind of come up with problems to solve together. But what are some of those hurdles? Like, what are some of the things that you do need to solve for in order to to make the best game you can with the, within this next couple of years? Yeah, I think for us, we have a, a pretty bold vision uh, for this game. Um, we want to construct an environment that. Uh, is open world. Uh, we uh, we'll call it open world ish, um, because we we go. Um, I wouldn't say we go back and forth, but we we haven't settled on the exact size. And so um, there there may be one giant open world. There may be you know multiple smaller open open you, worlds. You that mean are with AI, quite you're full. not going to make it infinite and growing <laughs> automatically. <laughs> I don't e- I, I don't even think that creates the best player experience. So there's a whole separate thread that we could get into around uh, even if you can, should you, right? It's um, like that Rick and Morty I, episode. I don't know if you're a Rick and Morty fan. I know there's also some controversy with Justin Roiland recently, but uh, but there's yeah. that one episode um, where they have a hyper-realistic video games. So they set mm-hmm. asteroids to like, ultimate realism and there's just no asteroids and they're just floating in space or street fighter where you have to wake up in the morning and go look through the city to go find your opponent to then fight them and that's not a fun game no no one wants to wander around the streets yeah. blindly like they there's certain things that don't need to be perfectly realistic for a game to be fun right yeah yeah exactly and, and that's actually kind of a, a good point because it is one of our theses about how we use ai um for so when you think about the content that we're creating right um you can sort of think about it in in the context of uh there's going to be characters enemies npcs and then the world and the objects that the world contains and the thing that people will care most about the thing that will create uh, emotional connections will be the characters um, if emotional connections are established between players and the game, the characters are the vessel for that emotional connection. And so when we think about how we use humans to create the game and AI to create the game, um, we want the humans who have, you know, decades of experience building uh, building this content that creates these emotional connections and feelings to be working on the most important things that create those connections. So, you know, the priority there is on the characters, the enemies, the NPCs, and then the world, and then AI working, um, in the opposite direction, focused on the world and the objects. And then, you know, anything that we can do back up to the character, if there are little details, things that we can, um, you know, what, maybe help drive some of the costs down, that would be good. But our big focus is on using AI to craft the world. What's the reasoning for it being so, so, so with characters being the most important, right? That hierarchy of characters, enemies, NPCs, mm-hmm. world. Why is AI focused in the other direction? Oh, because uh, you, you know, you can think of it as you have, you have to make, um, you have to make a trade off between where you invest your most valuable resources, you can almost think of it as a as an investment decision or a trade. And so 
um, regardless of how good AI is today, it's still not as good as the best humans. So you have to make a decision about where do you want the best work being done across the entire project. And so you make that investment across the characters. And then you make that investment with the enemies because the enemies will create other types of emotions, right? They should inspire fear and awe and, uh, and this feeling of, whether it's a horde of small enemies making you feel that you're overwhelmed and you, there's no way you could get out of this situation, but your hero can, um, or it's this giant monstrosity um, that we've you know shown in some of the previous uh, demos, um, who's just intimidating and inspires fear. Um, that's another that's another set of emotions, right? And then. The NPCs will drive similar emotions through the stories, and then the environment will be beautiful uh, and inspire awe, but it won't create um, these acute moments of emotion. It's more systemic uh, than anything. It's like a baseline of emotion, and it's the abilities and the personality of the character and the the strength and the power of the enemies that feels like it's insurmountable those are the those are the moments that um, evoke the, the most emotion and that's where you should invest the the best work the most detail on right and on top of that yeah i mean you're talking a lot about emotional connection right because that's what drives the engagement and makes it fun is the fact you feel something mm -hmm. like the first game I'd played in so long was like maybe two years ago. Um, I got a PS5 and started playing the God of War game. It was my favorite game growing up when I, when I had the PSP on long road trips and stuff. And yeah. so I got into it and I got sucked in and I, I forgot how cinematic some of these games have gotten where it's like almost mm -hmm. pulling you through a story. So it's it's guiding you and taking you through these cutscenes, and then yeah. you get to experience being for a minute. And it's very like... Like there's a reason why a lot of people talk about gaming and mental health right now is it's it's like an escape like you really do attach mm -hmm. to this character in this world for a period of time and the the human element of having humans work on those emotional elements makes a lot of sense to me at least where ai is today yeah. on the yeah. and it's it, it's not a uh, it's not a slight or a knock on how important the world is right because the world has to be beautiful and it has to be inspiring but it you know, if you have to stack rank those things, uh, it's important to know where where the players feel the connection, where they feel that emotion. And I'm assuming that the world building isn't still like, like AI is not quite at the level where you can just say, build me this world and it's perfect. Right. So I'm curious. Um, <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this the, the way that I see AI being involved in this stuff is it's just changing the way we communicate with technology. Right. So instead of having to learn a full uh, coding language or be able to learn all the different clicks inside of a piece of software you can speak your language english or whatever else like right like not everyone's going to use english but i, I will <laughs> and it basically is just coming up with an idea articulating it and then the computer now understands the direction that you're giving it that that's the big difference that ai is giving us right now with things like copilot and ChatGPT. gpt so where in yeah. your process and, you know your, uh, sorry, I, go, go ahead. I, I was gonna, i was just gonna say that um yeah, you know, like for us, we see, we, we kind of see it across like different areas of the business, right? Um, we see concept artists, we, we, we're probably staffed at about 25% um, of what we potentially would have needed because our concept artists are able to use uh, these generative tools to create their, you know, create like, actually like dozens or hundreds of concepts in the time that they would have created one concept in the past with, you know, even, even more fidelity. Um, and, um, and so we see like, that's probably the area of the business where it's got the most mature adoption, right? Like today it drives huge cost savings in that area. Um, so and then we, 
let's talk through that process real quickly because I think concept development is the number one most talked about thing in creative for AI right now. Every creative agency mm. is starting to use it internally. Most of the people I've talked to on the show talk about that creative discovery process and ideating ideas is where it's the most useful. Mm -hmm. In your team's process, how, how does that work? Um, are they just individually practicing prompts? Do you guys have a playbook for it? Like, how, how do you kind of work with the AI? Yeah, actually, it's a it's a mix of all of those things, right? So we actually have uh, a centralized repository on prompt engineering best practices. Um, we have uh, social channels where uh, the team shares everything that they're generating and uh, will like give prompt tips and tricks. So like things will things will materialize there before they make it into like the best practices guide. Um, we also have some tools that we've built uh, internally that can simplify the entire process, right? So we have a, a character generator that you can type um, a much more simplified prompt and it leverages a lot of the prompting best practices that we have and it'll generate um, dozens and dozens of concept images um, of different types of scenes. It'll ge generate, you know, characters in T-poses, characters in battles, characters in victory scenes, characters in death scenes. Um, Wait, so, all of so, these... So, so someone will put in a prompt and then you'll be, mm -hmm. a tool you built internally will basically take that prompt, redesign it to optimize it, and then... Yeah, redesign it into... Read it, yeah, redesign it into dozens of other prompts. Um, That's so to cool. match so like AI, all these things. An AI prompt generator almost that yeah. then yeah. will actually generate the AI assets. And I don't think we I don't think we've coined this. I'm pretty sure we we picked it up from somewhere else, but we call it like prompt to prompt, right? So um in mid journey and stable diffusion, you'll see people talk about text to image, you'll see people talk about image to image. Um I, I'm I know we picked this up somewhere, but it's uh the the core of the tool is that we do prompt to prompt uh, transformations. I love it. Yeah. There's um, this influencer. If you don't follow him already, his name's Mr. Grateful. Um, he's got this thing called Grateful mm -hmm. Labs. One of the uh, most compelling I've seen, at least on Instagram, where he basically took chat GPT and he's, he made it agent eight GPT where he's like, in the next 30 days, I want a hundred thousand followers. I want you to design an AI. Experiment oh yeah. Today. And then he did it. And now his next goal is to create a hundred million dollar company um, using nothing but AI and no employees. And so it's super interesting story and it's a lot. So I, I remember, I remember seeing that, that project, uh, and I, I watched it for like the first couple of days and I haven't looked at it since, but I remember thinking that, um, this guy was going to hit its goal, hit, hit his goal, but it was likely not going to be because um, like because of anything the agent did more the fact of he was the first person to hit like this curiosity thing and get like the viral flywheel spinning. Um, I, I don't know what the, you know, what the last, uh, 27 days of that 30 day challenge looked like. Um, but I remember seeing that like, the first day it, it blew up and it went off the charts. Um, yeah, and it was just think, because like people were, people were so entertained by the idea of this. Yeah. I think he hit the goal in like the first 10 days or something crazy. Um, yeah. and I think you're right. I think he just hit the perfect timing. Um, and I, I got to give him credit though. Cause I, I think when, whenever we talk about timing or luck with these things, like it's easy to like discount the work. It's like, he followed through yeah. and like produced a lot of content in 30 oh, days yeah, and ran yeah, a bunch of yeah. experiments. Um, so my, I'm, I'm... Uh, my, my comment wasn't on him. It was more on, it was more on, and I might be the biggest proponent of, of AI most people will meet in their lives. I think, I think we really do not fully understand just how much the way we work and create and do things is going to change over the next five to 10 years, uh, and even how much it's already changing. Um, but still, I run into the frustrations of working with these tools every day because I work with them so much. And um, so I am, uh, I, I, am, I am bullish on the long-term potential 
of uh, autonomous agents. Uh, I am bearish on the short term potential of yeah. those autonomous agents. Totally, totally <laughs> um, so agree. like there's this, viral... I am, I am short the next six months and long the nine and a half years after that. T totally agree. Like there's this viral <laughs> video going around of air AI, um, aut automating BDR, like sales work and oh, customer yeah. success. It's the same demo Google did with Google assistant calling and scheduling a haircut like five years ago. It's gotten better. Oh, um, yeah. and it's a great demo. But the latency and response time is still way too long to process yeah. and respond. It's still very generic entry level stuff. It's getting better, though. Um, in a few years, oh, it's yeah. going to get better and better. Um, I just want to do a quick time check. So is your hard stop right now or do you have 30, 30 minutes? I have 30 more minutes. All right. So let's go for a few more minutes then. Um, the, the other thing I just want to wrap up on the shout out to Mr. Grateful, I'm really excited about the next experiment. I think the first one, to your point, mm. is so timing oriented. It's that kind of virality, yeah. just the right concept, right time. And he followed through. But the next one, generating 100 million with an AI company with no employees, <laughs> that's a big goal. That's going to be that's, really, really yeah. tough. But I'm interested to see his approach and how he can do. Re coming back into Azra. So... With the tools, you already mentioned you've experimented with building some of your own with this AI to AI prompting. How much of your your AI use cases are leveraging existing tools like like a chat GPT or a mid journey uh, versus oh, yeah. like your like own? All, yeah, ultimately every one of them. We are not training our own foundational models. Um, I generally believe while it would be um, fun and it would satisfy um like the it would satisfy the curiosity of the technologist deep within me um it's it's f extremely uh unpragmatic for us uh as a business case right like um azra will not ultimately win or lose or be successful um based on us training our own model um it will be how do we find novel ways to use these tools to lower our costs, um, to perhaps even create um, new gameplay experiences, although that's further off on the horizon to me. Um, but uh, primarily, how do we how do we make the the cost structure of the business um, more optimal for us? That way we can provide more content to players um on faster cycles uh when when we're at global launch um and and ultimately um get to market faster and cheaper with better content i think that's really pragmatic because there's kind of two ways to think about a new tool like, like like ai's ability to help you be more effective one thing is to think about how do we take existing processes and just be 10 times more effective like like be the best mm -hmm. at the way things are done by using this tool to cut down our work, our work, um, or our time to, to deliver. Yeah. The other way to think about it is what are the new things that this lets us do that we couldn't do before? And how do we experiment with this, this brand new stuff? And I think that's where, when you talk about being bullish nine years, 10 years out, that's where a lot of those ideas sit. Like some of them might come faster, but those are much yeah. riskier bets where you're talking like a percent of every hundred ideas is going to be the one that, that works out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think too, like, um, if you, if you were just to go look on GitHub and, and take a close look at what's going on in the language model space, every day there's a new language model being released open source from somewhere in the world that's being benchmarked against chat GPT 3.5. And one of the things you're just seeing is that there's this, um, overall trend that um, smaller models, like like teams around the world are getting, are starting to get better results with smaller and smaller foundational models. Um, I think people are starting to um, really figure out what ultimately matters uh, inside the, the algorithms that drive everything internally and are you know starting to be able to remove um 
you know, waste or inefficiencies inside of those algorithms and inside of the weights. And, um, and so when I think about it, uh, if we were to invest our time there, we're basically just competing against a whole host of open source people to see if we can, if, if they beat, you know, GPT 3.5 by 1%, if we can beat it by 2%. Whereas, um, for us, what our game, what our, our future game players will care about the most, um, is, is this content fun? Um, I want to keep playing. I want to do something new. Um, give me more content, <laughs> give me more content. So I don't have to play the exact same content over again and everything that we can do to reduce the cost, to give them that abundance of content, uh, is ultimately a win for us and for them. So, uh, so many thoughts coming to mind on this. I think it's such a compelling topic. Um, the first one is I, I know I'm giving you a lot of compliments in this interview, but it's cause y'all are doing such great work. Like a lot of folks that are talking about AI in their business right now, I think that they're making a big mistake by letting AI become the main character of their business. Um, they're trying mm -hmm. to pivot from a web three company to an AI company. They're trying to pivot from a diverse <laughs> company to an AI company. We're seeing so much of that. And I think most of it's out of desperation for attracting VCs and investment and trying to, to catch someone's attention for what's hot right now. But there's someone who, who is doing a really good job of kind of uh, has, has had a big influence on my outlook on it. His name's Brendan Short. Um, he's creating a sales enablement tool for product led growth companies called Groundswell. And he's mm -hmm. been super interested in dabbling with AI and DAOs and all this new kind of tech. And where he's doubled down on AI is not as creating an AI sales company, but adding AI as like a kind of a core support feature within his product to make what he's already doing better. And that's kind of the, the reason I think of that example is that's kind of how it seems like you're talking about it at Azra. It's like, you're not an AI gaming company. You're still building an RPG. You're still a gaming studio that's dabbling with web three and the future of where gaming is going you're leveraging AI as a tool to do that core mission better. It's more like a supporting character than the, the core main protagonist of your Absolutely. business, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, everything we do is, is focused around the fact that, and, you know, reminding, the, because, you know, we, we will kind of go on our own soliloquies internally about how great AI is sometimes. And we always come back to reminding everyone that like you know as as great as ai is as 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 many advances have happened in the field over the last 12 months um we still have 250 years of rpg development experience in the studio and that's fundamentally the greatest asset it's the collective knowledge of the entire team um and and so that's where our focus always has to be and it's always about using the technology to ultimately augment and reduce, uh, augment the people and reduce the cost of creating the content. Um, and, um, you know, to that, to the point of, uh, what Groundswell is doing, um, I think that's phenomenal. I think a lot of, uh, investors that I've talked to who, um, uh, who have, you know, struggled with what should I do with this hype cycle? You know, should I go all in on basically every AI company, uh, you know, pre-seed seed that comes across my desk? And I think, uh, you know, there is some hype, some FOMO in the market, but I think there's a lot of them that are actually pretty wise. And, and um, one of the best things that uh, best piece of advice I got from one of these investors was that his core thesis was that. Uh, the two areas that value would aggregate to would be um, one on the picks and shovels of the infrastructure. So the chip makers like NVIDIA or whoever can dethrone or take market share from NVIDIA and the language models like, um, like OpenAI or if someone like Anthropic uh, can come along and dethrone them. Uh, and then the second, which is where he was actually way more interested uh, in betting, was on companies that were using AI to be more efficient in their day-to-day. -day. 
to embed it in their existing tools, to not make an AI product, but to make their entire company just more efficient by using AI. Um, and so I think, you know, it's great that Groundswell is doing that. I think, um, you know, that investor that I'm thinking of would probably uh, kudos them and give them that advice as well. Yeah, it's um, it, it's very similar to um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Eric Redmond at Nike. Uh, he founded their their technical innovation office. This is probably the fifth episode now. I've shouted him out. At some point, I got to start sending him sound bites and get him on the show. Um, <laughs> but he wrote a book called Deep Tech, um, and it's a great book. Mm -hmm. I think every CEO of a, a Fortune 500 company should read it just because of how relevant it is. He wrote it only a couple of years ago, and what it dives into is the seven emerging technologies that he calls deep tech like these things that are barely fathomable as to what they'll do like 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 will they work will they not work it's it's hard to really say but when they've progressed and grow into what they could become we're not going to be able to know what society would be like without them they're just going to be so impactful mm -hmm. and and one of the core themes of that book and why i think of them when we, we talk about ai like this is he he says every company is a tech company like that's the last 20 years of what we saw happen is like if you're an airline if you're an automotive company if you're a consumer goods company it doesn't matter because technology whether it's with your internal processes or your marketing and how you connect with customers it creates leverage it lets you run your business so much more effectively when you use technology the right way that you have to be a technology business in addition to whatever industry you work in and so that's why we're seeing a growth in these technical innovation teams. These these VPs of innovation, these CIO roles are starting to become more popular. And I would argue they still don't have as big of a seat at the table as, as they need to. Traditionally, CEOs have always been like sellers and accountants, um, really good at finance and getting customers and maybe marketing. But this technology piece is becoming more and more important every single year. Um, so I wonder like, how, how do you think about that? Is that something as an investor that you look at? Is that balance of, of uh, technical leadership versus sales marketing leadership? Like, how do you kind of suss out if a company is prioritizing the right things there? Yeah, I mean, when I do diligence on any of the companies I uh, invest in at the early stage, um, I'm usually doing light background checks on founders. I'm usually investing through syndicates. So the syndicate vouching for the team is, you know, often a positive signal in and of itself, right? But then I go above and beyond that, right? Like maybe you want to just take the person at their word for it. Maybe you want to read their memo, take their recommendation. Um, I do enjoy kind of going through the process though. And so I want to know, like, you know, have these founders worked together before? Um, in, inside of the founding team, do they have uh, complementary skill sets um, or are they, you know, somewhat redundant, right? Like um, if you had a CEO and a, a, a chief product officer, but the CEO is really the product person, right? Like that's, that's like redundancy. Maybe you need more of a salesperson um, that they haven't gotten yet. Um, so I, I'm usually looking for um, like, what is the, what is the risk in the whole equation? Not just um, is this leader um, tech focused versus uh, sales focused? I think different businesses require different things. I also think different businesses require um, different things at different times, right? Like, um, in the early stage of a deep tech business, um, you may need someone who has no people management skills, no sales skills, just extreme innovation and, and tech uh, experience or, um, uh, or, or ability. Um, whereas once, you know, that thing becomes a reality, um, that CEO either has to um, has to grow into the CEO the company needs, um, or has to uh, surround themselves with all of the people that can fill in their gaps, or has to find the time to transition into you know a chairman or a president role, 
um, and hand it over to maybe a CEO who has a better blend of sales and marketing versus um, product innovation, right? So I, I think uh, the context of the business uh, really drives a lot of those things. What's the space? What's the team? What stage are they at? Have they already found product market fit? Do they already have traction? Um, so I'm usually looking at those things more than just, um, or I would put it this way. I don't have uh, a strong bias that I want to make an investment because this person is a tech person um, or a salesperson. Um, that's, that makes- you know, probably fifth or sixth order of something that I would look at. And it's more of just having an awareness of um, uh, of what what skills exist in the team. Um, and then uh, if there's anyone in my network that I think I can refer to them that might be able to help them in the future. I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's like it's it's less about are you technical or are you marketing focused? It, it's more about what's the stage of the business and do you have the right skill sets on the team to fulfill yeah. those different needs? So like it, you're just yeah. checking if the right things are being prioritized based on the business and their situation. Um, yeah. And, and to kind of stretch out the idea of product market fit, I, I often think, too, that a lot of times there is, you know, founder market fit and there's also like founder market stage fit. Right. Like you can kind of think about it in sort of that mental model, like and that's just a short it's just a short three word summary for like that um, entire explanation of like you might need the te- the deep tech person to innovate and then they might need a handoff right like they were that they did have um, found their uh, market fit but then as you got to like a later stage maybe that person didn't have found their market stage fit. Yeah. And, and I mean, not everyone's a Jensen or a Zuck, right? Like, like not everyone can steer a trillion dollar tanker and <laughs> keep that thing moving. Like, and not everyone yeah, wants it's... to either. Like, like I was talking yeah. to somebody who's a consultant for sales and marketing stuff and everyone's like, like you, dude, you've been killing it these last two years. He's got clients left and right. He's starting to turn some people down. Yeah. And the thing that he has to debate now is do I start hiring people and scale this to, you know, a few million dollars a year and start becoming a consulting firm or do I keep waking yeah. up at 10 AM and sleeping in and then playing guitar and hanging out? <laughs> like, like there's a lot of flexibility yeah. in there. Right. Um, wh- one of the other questions I have for you uh, from an investor perspective, it, w- if you c- could invest in any company or if you had the time, if you weren't doing Azra and you could start any company in the web three metaverse or AI space, what problem do you think needs to be solved for? What would you spend your time or your investment on? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, so I, I do angel investing already. Um, and I think, uh, I think the way I think about it is like, it's more of a question of, um, why Combinator will often do requests for startups. Um, so if it's okay, I'll like maybe transform that question into like, um, w- w- if you were like writing requests for startups, what would be the, the, the areas that you're more interested in the places that you see gaps? Um, also, by the way, I'm totally comfortable with you plugging a company in your portfolio. If there's, <laughs> one, if there's one that you think is already doing a good job too. <laughs> um, so, well, actually, like um, one of the areas uh, I tend to uh, hyper focus on because it's a uh, it's just like um, a personal obsession of mine um, is biohacking. Right. Um, so um, last few years, I've lost a, a decent amount of weight. I've worked on what, optimizing what in, in uh, Zempic or uh, was that was the diabetes drug that's super hot. Right yeah. Now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there are pharmaceuticals, but there, you know, are um, other other paths to, to things. And it's it goes beyond weight. Right. Like uh, how good is your blood work? What is your diet? What is your um, uh what are like your core habits, those kinds of things. I think um, 
you know, one of the companies that I had uh, made an investment in last year that's just crushing is um, basically it, it's a um, it's a D to C company uh, for helping men uh, improve their testosterone levels without TRT. Um, so if you go on TRT, you will uh, most people will often lose the uh, ability to produce testosterone naturally. Um, they're absolutely crushing it. The name of the company is uh, Maximus. Um, I love that company, and I love I love their mission. I love everything they do. Um, I think a request for startup for me would just be in that entire space of the intersection of longevity, biohacking, um, and AI. I think that we. Um, I think that we underestimate how much better we our lives could be in the later stages of life um, if we did the small things right early on. Um, the same way that investments compound over time, the same way that optimizations in businesses compound over time, uh, our personal habits and the impacts and the tolls that that takes on our health um is uh, also compounds over the course of our life uh, and i think you know for uh some people they you know they live to their late 90s extremely healthy uh and then some people you know suffer for 20 years uh towards the end of their life and um you know only get that 20 years because of dependence on uh, the pharmaceutical industry or um, are, are a myriad of specialists who are uh, tweaking this one thing and now, you know, having to tweak an, another area to try to provide this person relief. Um, and so that, to me, that, that's like one of the biggest opportunities. And I think we, we fundamentally underestimate how much better so many people um, could uh, experience the, the later stages of their life. Um, and just how valuable that would be to each person, to each family, um, and aggreg aggregately to the entire society. Um, so that would be my request for startup. Anybody that has great ideas, um, email me, DM me, hit me on Twitter. Um, I would uh, love to, uh, you know, um, evaluate that. I feel like we could have a whole other podcast episode just diving into that subject. <laughs> I, um, you're speaking yeah, absolutely. my language. Like me and my roommate are obsessed with it. I'm working on shaving off all the COVID pounds right now myself. And um, it's like me and my grandma have been bonding over watching Huberman together and like keeping up to date on like <laughs> no. to hack our, our, our brain chemistry, staring at, you know, get, getting out in the sunlight in the mornings and pushing caffeine out. Like there's so many like I, cold showers, you know, all, all this stuff. Like I'm not a Huberman maxi by any means, but I love diving into all of that sort of stuff. Oh my God. I um, saw a TikTok over the weekend. It was the first time I ever heard this phrase. It was called, um, this woman said she had a Huberman husband and that she loved him <laughs> and that she loved him, but he was driving her crazy. Yeah. There's some people that are really hardcore about it. Like I'm not as crazy to where like, I won't put my phone in my pocket cause it'll, you know, it's too close to my privates and my testosterone levels. Like there's certain things that I'm just not willing to let myself feel fear of every single day. Cause I think yeah. that there's a cost, right? Um, like mm -hmm. there's effort and mental energy you have to put into these things. And some of them have great oh. immediate trade-offs. Some have much smaller trade-offs and it's all about balancing what, what's right for you yeah. and your lifestyle. But uh, I know we're getting yeah. close to time. So, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you. This has been such an interesting and amazing conversation. Like I said, I'd be happy to do it again. Like, like this was really fun and I could probably talk to you for three or four more hours, but, um, with the last couple of minutes, is there anything you want to plug? Where can people find you? Um, give you an opportunity to share anything you're working on. Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly heads down working on Azra. You guys can go to uh, Twitter and uh, find Azra Games, and uh, you can find me on TJ Boudreau uh, on Twitter. Um, I, uh, I I mostly spend my time uh, liking and commenting, though I don't really have the bandwidth for lots of posts these days. But um, if anybody wants to talk games, Web three. Uh, angel investing, AI, technology in general, uh, always slide into the DMs. Uh, I love, you know, really good, interesting conversations with cool people in the space. 
Hell yeah. Thanks so much, Travis. We'll throw a bunch of those links down in the description as well. As yep. always, hit subscribe, follow, check us out on LinkedIn, YouTube, or uh, whatever podcast platform you prefer. And that's the pod. Thanks.